I know it's kind of weird, but I just kind of want to stress the stress. Uh, how many of you guys have ever experienced stress? See All right, this is what I want you to do. Um, how many of you are experiencing stress right now? Or are you kind of in the middle of it? So what I want you to do, I want you to close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. We're not going to pray, but I just want you to close your eyes. <coughs> Take a deep breath in. Let it out. I want you to imagine yourself in the Bahamas. I want you to imagine yourself sitting on a white sand beach. I want you to just picture yourself laying there and it's the late afternoon and you're watching the sun go down. And can you feel the stress melting away? Can you? Now wake up. Come back to reality, okay? A um, couple years ago, uh, more than a couple years ago now, back in the mid-90s, I was in college and I was working um, and I was trying to do ministry and had a family. I uh, had a lot of irons in the, fam in the fire. I went to this uh, small group that we had at our church that our pastor was doing. And our pastor was, um, he has a doctorate degree in counseling. And uh, he was doing this seminar thing at his house on stress. And he gave us this test um, the big, to take at the beginning of the seminar. And it was like, uh, if you have experienced um, a move in the last year, the right down this note. If you um, have experienced the loss of a job or if you experience, you know, all these things that can cause stress in your life. And um, as he did that test, and I'm sitting there marking it down, and I got to the end of it, and you're supposed to add up, you know, what your, the number of what your stress level is. And then we were going to share it as a group, and as everybody was going around the room, they got over to me, and I'm thinking... My stress level was like, I don't know, I can't remember the number. It was like five or 600, and it's supposed to be like 100 or 200. Mine was like five or 600. I mean, I, it was just off the chart thing. Matter of fact, everybody was like, are you sure that's right? And I'm not a very good mathematician, so I looked at it and tried to do it. I said, well, that's what it says. And I went down through here. I said, yep, we've done that, we've done that, we've done that, we've done that. Uh, and my pastor goes, man, that can cause, you know, some real physical ailments when you get stressed like that. I said, well, that explains that last month I had my appendix taken out. He goes, yep, exactly. Um, and um, all of us in life experience stress. And this morning, I want to talk to you about stress. And I'm not, and you're, you're, I know your mind, because you're probably thinking, man, the pastor's going to tell us how to relieve our stress. Aren't you anticipating that type of message? You desiring that type of message? Are you? I mean, do you want somebody to tell you how to relieve your stress? That is not this message. Sorry. No, sorry. Matter of fact, this is a message that probably will add to your stress. Sorry. Uh, that's just the text. Okay, I, I don't blame me. Blame the text. Okay. <laughs> Now we're going to get ready to, to, to look at. Um, and I'll explain it because when I re first read this particular text, you're not going to get that there's stress involved in it. But after I get through explaining it, yeah, hopefully you'll get it. Because here's the deal. God has not designed you to live stress-free. He hasn't. Uh, because stress-free would mean you were asleep and doing absolutely nothing. Or sitting on a beach... You know, doing absolutely nothing but watching the sun go down. And although that's, you know, great and we would love to be able to do that, uh, and, and sometimes we need to do that as far as taking a vacation, you need to do that from time to time. But you can't live there. I mean, how many of us wish that God would call us to be missionaries to the Bahamas? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, for most of us, God, God's not going to call us there. On the other extreme either, but God's not called us to live in this maximum stress level for a long period of time either. God's not called us to live there. There is somewhere in the middle, there is this happy medium. But God has designed you and I to be able to take stress, to think about stress, to be stressed over certain issues, 
Because when you're stressed about certain issues, it encourages you to go out and do something about those particular issues, doesn't it? Because our goal is, most of the time when we're feeling stressed, our, our main idea is how in the world do I get out of that stress? You get out of that stress not by you know, sitting on the beach, although sometimes that's needed, but when you come back to reality, you still got the same stress level that you had when you left. You know, last year we went on a cruise, and I, you know, I was just hyped up about that. And you know, we ten minutes from the house, we got on the ship down at uh, down downtown, and we're able to get on that ship. Well, it took us a little bit more than ten minutes, but we got there. And by the time we got on the ship, they tell you the first thing you do on this cruise ship is go to the food. Praise the Lord. <laughs> um, and you know, it was kind of one of those, those vacations where you went and you just didn't really have to worry about anything and you could, and I didn't worry about a diet and all that kind of stuff and you could go to the pool and you could eat and you could go to the pool and you could eat and you could go to the pool and you could mm -hmm. eat. Great vacation. Um, but God's not designed us to live there because when I got off the boat I had the same issues as when I got on the boat. So God has called us when stress comes in our life that we're supposed to do something with it. And this morning I want you to look at a passage of scripture that I hope speaks volumes to you this morning. Jude, the second to the last book in the Bible, right before the book of, Jude, of Revelation, Jude. And there's only one chapter in the book of Jude, it's a real short book. Jude, verse 3. If you found that or if you're looking for that, you don't bring a Bible, the verse is going to be on the screen. Go ahead, Chris, and put that verse up there. Jude chapter 3, would you stand with me this morning as I read the text? Jude chapter 3. I mean, you're Jude verse 3, sorry. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt it necessary to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Good verse, right? Great verse. I love this verse. Let's pray. Father, um, help us to understand this verse. Help us to understand what Jude was talking about. Father God, help us to be motivated to go out and do something about it. And I just pray to God, Lord, that you will just empower us. Father Lord, for what you called us to do within ourselves we cannot do. But Father Lord, would you speak to us this morning? I praise you and I honor you, Father Lord, for what you're going to do in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may see it. In our culture today, um, when you begin to look at the church, there's a lot of people who look at the church, the modern day church, especially people who are not in the church will look at the church with a lot of disdain. You and I probably don't do that because we're, we, we're believers and we believe in the church and we think, man, there's great things in the church. But there's a lot of people out in the world that look at the church with a lot of disdain. And let me prove it to you. There is a statistic out there that, that is the statistic in just about every city in the nation. Over the past 50 years in our culture, in every city, and especially in Charleston, the population has increased, obviously, right? I mean, over the past 50 years, there's more people today living in Charleston, living on this planet than there ever has been, right? While the population has increased, the interest in church and the interest in God has declined. And it is that way in every city in America. Just take the Baptist churches in Charleston. If you were to study the statistic and you were to go back 30 years ago, just 30 years ago, you would find that there are more people in our Baptist churches 30 years ago than there are today. Yet the population of Charleston has increased a lot in that time period, but yet there's less people in our churches. And that just, that's just not Baptist churches. That's all of them. And now a lot of us look around and go, well, what about Seacoast? Or what about Cathedral of Praise? Or what about you know this particular church or that particular church that seems to be growing? You can take all of those churches 
And if you were to take all of the people that are even in those churches and add them back to our churches, you would find a de decrease in number as well. I mean, it's just not there. And I think one of the things that we've, we've got in our culture is we've got folks that are just comfortable. I mean, we don't want to think about, we don't want anything to add stress to our lives because our lives are stressful enough. You think about your job. I mean, most, some of you may be retired, but a lot of you I know about you is that you live, work in very stressful jobs. I mean, just think about it. I mean, Miranda is a nurse. I mean, sometimes people's lives, their very lives are dependent on her. And you think about Michael. I mean, if Michael doesn't do his job, there might be a nuclear explosion that happens in Goose Creek. <laughs> and you think about this. These are pretty stressful jobs. And you think about, man, and, and, and so we live in this world that's just inundated with stress. And when we get to church, we don't want to think about stress because we just, that's a place of relief. That's a place where we can go and we want to find solitude and rest in the arms of Jesus. And certainly you do find those things. But we don't want stress added to church. We don't want stress added to our relationship with Jesus. And I'm here to tell you that that is not what God ever intended at all. He never intended anybody just to accept Jesus and to be, you know, comfortable. God doesn't call us into life of, com of comfort. I'm on TV. Uh, he might have turned that off, but it's pointing straight at me. I feel like I'm on TV. Um, sorry, ADD kicking in there. Um, but God's not called us to a life of comfort. As a matter of fact, you only need to look at the people that have gone before us. As a matter of fact, when you begin to study this passage of Scripture, Judah saying this, Beloved, while I make every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt it necessary to write to you that you um, earnestly contend for the faith. The, the two words in there, I make every effort, and I found it necessary to write to you to earnestly contend, all of those words have an urgency about them. They have this stress that's related to them. And we don't want to hear that. But I'm here to tell you that when you begin to study this passage of Scripture, you and I, when you look at just in the last 10 or 15 years, we need to add some stress to our lives about the urgency of ministry. The urgency of our faith. And you and I have got to just look around at the people that have gone before us. We have a history of diligence. When you think about the history of the church, when you think about the history of people who have come and followed Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, what you find is people that look at the idea of the faith in Jesus as very diligent. I mean, just for instance, just take the apostles. Just look at their lives. When you begin to study history about the apostles, these were men who watched Jesus walk around and heal people. He also, they also watched Him teach and heard Him teach. And at the very end of the life of Jesus, they watched Him be nailed to a cross. And a lot of them thought it's over. As a matter of fact, I... That's probably what was going through Judas Iscariot's mind. Man, you know, I've been following this guy for three years. And man, what have I got to show for it? Nothing. You know, 30 pieces of silver? What's that? And that, that ain't even mine, really. And, um, you know, Judas kind of had that, probably had that idea. Man, what a, what's, a, what, what's, what's it worth? But for the other 11 guys... You study their lives. These are men who absolutely witnessed the resurrection of Jesus and were so convinced that He was God on foot that they gave their very lives for it. The history tells us that Peter was going to be crucified and he told the, his crucifiers, I am not worthy to be uh, crucified like my Savior, crucified me upside down. And history says that Peter was nailed to a cross, crucified upside down for his faith. Other of the apostles were put into logs, sawed in two. Some of them were put on stakes, boiled in oil, 
uh, set on fire. Every apostle, except for one, martyred for their faith. They believed in Jesus so much that they gave their life for the cause. You and I need to get a hold of that idea. And even in our modern day culture, there's a guy that uh, uh, go to the first frame. I want you to see this. Um, we have a history of diligence. Go, to, go ahead and go to the next next screen, Chris. Um, Jim Elliott. How many of you have heard? How many of you have not ever heard of Jim Elliott? Okay, for those of you who have never heard of Jim Elliott, about 50 years ago, um, he was a missionary. Uh, and he and his uh, um, fellow uh, missionaries were missionaries um, in um, South America, uh, in Ecuador. And they had found these group of people called the Alca Indians, had never heard the gospel of Jesus. And they were so convinced that these, that these, these natives needed to hear Jesus that they, they felt compelled to go to Him. But there was a danger involved in that because the Alcas were known to be uh, cannibals. These were people who would kill you for the least little thing. But what Jim and Elliot and, and some of his, uh, Nick Sane and some of his guys did, they, they started flying over their village. And as they would fly over their village, they would drop them packages of goods and stuff, like presents. And they did that for several months. They would fly over, drop them a package, and watch the Indians get it. Um, and, and there came a time where they decided that they were going to land their plane on the beach there uh, beside one of the rivers. So that's exactly what they did. They landed their plane on this river and uh, started to make friends with these Alka Indians. Eventually, just before they were supposed to head back, the Alcas showed up uh, and killed every single one of them. Spirit through, they gave their life for the gospel. Later, it was found in Jim Elliott's um, diary, he wrote this. You're going to have to help me because um, uh, I kind of get emotional about this. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Most of us hear stories about the Jim Elliots of this world. And we hear stories about the apostles. And we hear stories about people who are giving their life for Jesus. And we go, oh man, that's good. We need to pray for them. And, and, and absolutely, yeah, we need to pray for missionaries who are going to people like the Alka Indians and people who have never heard the gospel. Sure, we need to pray for them. But have we ever stopped and thought about the fact that God calls us not to safety, not to padded pews. God calls us to earnestly contend for the faith even if it means giving up your very life. 